Hello and welcome everybody to this Canon AI topic webinar. I'm glad that you're all here. We have a very interesting session just to come. Let me just shortly introduce myself. My name is Stefan Nius. I'm the deputy director of the Department of Radiology at Charité here in Berlin. And I'm so glad that we have two more great speakers within today's session. It is Professor Michael Ohana from Strasbourg and also Dr. Benoit Sauer, also from Strasbourg, two very experienced speakers, which will join today in the second and third talk. As I already told you, this uh, webinar is a Canon webinar. So thank you very much the complete team and staff from Ken for letting this session happen. And um, I'm very glad that you uh, are um, here and allow us to talk about very, very interesting and very, very recent topics of real world applications of AI. So without further ado, I will start as the uh, first speaker and I will introduce the other speakers in more detail as soon um, as they will be having their talk. So um, my talk today will be on strength and uh, limitations of uh, AI-based CT processing. Where are we now? So it's a rapidly changing field and I will just give you an overview of what will be possible by today. Um, these are my uh, disclaimers and just to let you know that I'm totally aware of the difference between artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, neural networks and deep learning. I'll just use AI as it covers all and will be a little bit more simple to follow. So AI has become a very present part of everyday life within radiology. And if you look at the number of publications of AI and radiolo uh, radiology, they have been increasing uh, by far uh, during the last few years. And it's not only the scientific view, but also the FDA approvals in radiology. Since um, May 2008, we have not less than 392 FDA approvals just within the field of radiology. And if we look at this year, 2022, there had been 91 FDA approvals covering AI. And of those 91, it has been 79 within the field of radiology. So we have the vast majority of all FDA approvals with AI in medicine. So it's a very interesting and strong um, topic which we are covering today. The typical areas of applications which are already available are of course image optimization like denoising. We'll uh, get more of this information during today's session. We have A applications on brain for hemorrhage, stroke detection. We have lung applications for tumor screening, infectious diseases, pulmonary embolism and so much more. On the abdomen, we have lymph node detection, vascular abnormalities, and more. But we also have lots of lots of applications on development, coding, GANs, algorithms. Um, but which seems to be uh, forgotten many times. Also in, in management, we have AI applications, for example, for reimbursement coding, which we will not uh, talk about today. It's a more clinical talk today. So we have also problems when we use AI because. Um, at the moment, most of the AI solutions are distributed by startups, some vendors and some companies in, in various different solutions. So they normally don't regularly interact with each other. The way how you can integrate them into your clinical workflow can be very difficult. It could be a local based solution, could be a cloud based solution. Um, integrated into your hardware, like some vendors do have, or just a software application, which you can uh, perform or let run on your um, virtual environment, for example. We do have data privacy issues, which may occur depending on where you actually are. And of course, it's a very fast evolving technology, which has various updates in short time and so much more. 
And if you have an AI solution up and running, it could also be prone to artifacts, which might lead to, for example, false positive results, which then, of course, can cause possible confusion or maybe even unnecessary treatment. False negative results could end in a possible failure to treat our patients with severe consequential damage. And keep in mind that by now, the on-site learning of AI algorithms is not possible or at least restricted so that they will always perform like they have been trained in advance and they will not further develop on your interests or your decisions. They are steady uh, once they are um, online with the clinicians. So from a Canon perspective, Canon has launched Altivity officially in November 2021, and it is an innovation brand that consolidates machine learning and deep learning technologies. And I'm very, very happy that I by now have already like one and a half years of experience with the automation platform. And we started with Stroke and we extended it. And I'm so happy to, to tell you more about the different applications which are actually available at the time. And we have been in very uh, close contact with the uh, Canon team. And, they, and I think this makes it quite special that they will listen to you as a clinician uh, once you, you use this automation platform. So it is further developed in cooperation with clinicians facing and, and, and um, covering the needs of your daily practice. This LTVT platform includes informed healthcare workflows, fast and tailored care, and of which we will talk today is ACE, the peak technology and the automation platform. And I will start with the automation platform. Um, if we have a look at the conventional process of how a report uh, is, is done, that you will start with the image acquisition, transfer it to some kind of IT technology. In case of uh, special um, post-processing, you will need to select or load further images, analyze them, uh, save maybe example results or images or screenshots, prepare them for a result, and then have the final result written and transferred to your um, other disciplines. It's, as you can see, quite, quite a long way. And the AI automation platform here really shortens this because the categorization, the analyzation, the prioritization, they will all be performed automatically with a zero-click uh, solution and the automation platform. That after the scan and the image transfer to the AI, you will get the final results without further ado for interpretation, which will then reduce burden, increase your productivity and save time, not only your time, but also the time for our patients until they get their um, final results. Applications available by today, I already told you, it started with a stroke a solution with hemorrhage detection, the aspect score, a fully automatic perfusion a calculation and visualization and the large vessel occlusion detection. And now we have pulmonary embolism detection and aortic dissection released. Um, these two are the two new ones and I'll cover those both in the rest of my talk. So why might they have chosen pulmonary embolism? I guess you all know that is a, a common and sometimes really fatal disease, and it can range from having no symptoms at all uh, up to sudden death. And many patients, and even those with larger PE, can have mild symptoms or even none. So you still need to, to um, pick these patients. And we all know that the CT angiogram is the modality of your choice using contrast to find out if there is a PE or not. And the automatic pulmonary embolism detection will have the uh, possibility of a triage and notification of your PE scans and flagging and communicating suspected or even absent findings um, in your uh, packs. And how does this look like? These are the regular um, thumbnails I have in my packs, for example. And if I turn on the automation platform, there's just a small but brilliant difference. It's this one. 
I have one more image within my thumbnails. And in this case, I have just the information as a preview image, which says, okay, we don't have any findings suspected of pulmonary embolism. In case of positive findings, I just enlarge it in this um, presentation. You can have no findings, or in case you have suspected findings, they'll just not only let you know, but give you key images of the findings, as you can see here, marked in red, that you can see where the system detected a pulmonary embolism, so that you at glance can check if this is a finding you need to immediately take care of, or maybe if this can wait a few minutes longer. How long does it take for such an algorithm to perform the way I just showed you? Um, this is what the um, company gave uh, or gives you an information. It's in median, it's 60 seconds. So just a minute of processing time until they received the images, until you get your final results. So I guess um, most of us will not be faster with their final um, results. And this was the reported sensitivity and specificity of more than 91%. So we have a huge area under the curve. So it's very, very stable and um, precise in how it works. It's almost comparable to aortic dissection, the second entity which I will talk today. Although this is quite uncommon, and if then it presents mostly a very acute patients with a catastrophic illness, they report on, on acute onset of pain, and patients might even be unstable in your emergency department. And in this case, early and accurate diagnosis and treatment will be crucial for the survival of our patients. And again here, CT will be the most common modality of your choice because it's widespread available and it's mostly set in emergency departments. So those both entities are emergency entities that you need to cover in a fast and stable and correct manner. Again, here you will get thumbnails, which says, okay, we have no findings of aortic dissection, or in case of positive findings, they'll tell you, giving you the key image here with the red um, lines, you can see that there is a dissection there. And, and they also tell you that this, in, this uh, patient is a type B aortic dissection. So this is very interesting. If you have a larger dissection, if you have multiple dissections, they will provide multiple key images that you can see the whole extent of this dissection. Again, here the processing time in median is a little bit more than 34 seconds, so it's very, very fast. And on aortic dissection, they have an even larger sensitivity of 96% and a specificity of 97%. So they can, you can really rely on the results being presented uh, by the automation platform. Well, detecting those findings is one thing, but it must be visible, it must be understood by the physicians and how this is solved, I will tell you right now, there is a separate series within your packs I just showed you. They have a presentation state if your packs will be able to accept this. So right within the original series, I'll give you a hint that there is a finding there. It's almost the same. It just looks a little bit different that it um, shows you here a white sign um, within the original series as you scroll through the images. And you can clearly see those, those findings there as well. You have a web interface of the automation platform, which will highlight cases on your reading list, which positive findings that you have this opportunity to triage those patients, prefer those with positive findings, so you don't lose time to report on these. And in some findings, you have the possibility of insight results, which will be or can be sent via email. And if you use push notification, that even if you are not right in the emergency department, you get an email notification that you have positive findings on some entity with the key images provided there. So you don't lose any time on those patients with positive findings. Well, the strength, I just showed you, it's a local application of AI solutions, so we don't have any privacy issues here. The automation platform has a dispatcher functionality so that they will see 
upon those images it will receive on which application they will start. It's a zero click solution, so it just works on its own. The results will be within your packs in a median of 60 seconds latest with a high area under the curves. But we also need to talk about possible limitations here. Um, no algorithm, to be honest, will have a 100% accuracy yet. So it may be a case where this system might report on a type B aortic dissection right within your left kidney, which is false. So you just need to check those results. So it is intended to assist hospital networks and trained radiologists, and you should take this very serious. And just to mention one more small limitation, the initial setup might require some time. So the key facts uh, I want to provide within my talk that AI has merged into clinical routine workflow by now and is present. The typical application areas include stroke, pulmonary embolism and aortic dissection. So everything which is important to recognize very fast and to react on those uh, findings. The uh, um, automation platform will provide immediate assistance you can use as a second look or improve confidence or just to have a prioritization in your reading list to improve your patient care using this automation platform. That's all from my side. Uh, thank you for listening to my talk. By now, I guess we will, can already move to the uh, next speaker. And I'm so happy to have as the next speaker, Professor Mikhail Ohana from the University of Strasbourg. He is a very, very experienced radiologist in France, well known not only in France, but far beyond. And he is a, um, an expert on, on chest and cardiac. And uh, I'm so happy he is joining us today. He'll talk about super resolution, uh, deep learning reconstruction in coronary CTA, advanced precision diagnosis with PEAK, Mikael, the stage is yours. I'm very interested on your talk. Thank you so much, Stefan, for the very kind introduction. Thank you also to Canon for organizing this webinar. Thank you everyone for attending. And it is my pleasure to present uh, our first results with an advanced super resolution DLR technique. So when we speak, here are my disclosures. And when we speak of ultra high resolution CT, everyone know it's thinking about photon counting CT. It's buzzing everywhere. You go to any convention in radiology, in cardiology, whatever, you hear photo counting CT everywhere. But ultra high resolution CT is clinically available since November 2017, so five years ago. And it is the Aculian precision with a 0 0.25 millimeter detector size, the availability to have 1024 and 2048 matrix size, and also since uh, last year, the availability of DLR for uh, ultra high resolution acquisition CT. There are already quite a lot of publications using this machine in cardiac, chest, MSK, neuro, and yet, even if it's available for like more than five years now, it is still largely underdeployed, mostly because of the cost, but also because when you choose to uh, buy a uh, ultra high resolution CT, you will kind of lose some of the major advantages of the actual conventional city, which namely you will not have the possibility to have wide area detector. So you have only four centimeter coverage, which for the heart is quite limited. You lose the uh, fast gantry rotation. It is limited to 0 0.35 seconds. And the recommended usage is 120 kilovolt for the acquisition while on conventional CT, usually you go for 100 kilovolt. So these are the drawbacks of, the current drawbacks of ultra high resolution CT. And the question is, what if we could overcome this limitation by directly bringing the potential advantages of ultra high resolution CT to the conventional CT? And well, it's merging like best of both worlds. And this is what SRDLR, so Super Resolution Deep Learning Reconstruction, aka PIC, is about. So in the uh, next 10 to 15 minutes, I propose to answer three relevant questions about this topic. 
So first of all, what are the current body of evidences for uh, using ultra high resolution CT in cardiac imaging? Second, how is SRDLR working and how can it be applied in clinical routine? And third, what are the future development of this technology? So first of all, what about UHR CT in general in cardiac imaging? So the current stage of research in UHR CT are very, very similar, whatever the technology, whether with UHR CT or whether with photon counting CT, all the researches are focusing on the advantages induced by the very thin slice thickness and the increased matrix size, mostly a sharper image quality, a reduced artifacts, partial volume and bloomings, and also an improved detection and characterization of small anatomical structures. Basically, all these theoretical advantages explain that like most of the research in uh, UHR CT cardiac imaging focuses on either highly calcified vessels or stents and some on plaque characterization and quantification. And when we dive into uh, the, the latest uh, publication, I think that the most comprehensive one of the topic has been published last year in Radiology Cardiothoracic Imaging by Latina and all. This is a prospective single center study Basically, what I have done, all the patient that has been referred to their center for ICA, so invasive coronary angiography, had a atrocity before. And the primary endpoint was the diagnostic accuracy of atrocity. So the other choice is to focus is mostly on very challenging patients with severe CAD. Keep in mind that in this uh, study published last year, but the acquisition of the images has been two or three years before the publication, it, uh, the uh, UHR city were reconstructed only with IDEA 3D, so with iterative reconstruction and not with DLR. Otherwise, 0.25 millimeter slice thickness, 1024 matrix size, so a real UHR city. In the end, 15 patients were included. And when you see it, they are quite challenging. So it's relatively big patients, patient with stents, patient with high calcium score. You see that also the radiation dose of the coronary CTA was high, but this is really challenging patient, the one that you don't like to have on your rotation. And in the end, when comparing per vessel uh, accuracy compared to uh, ICA, well, in the end, it's actually quite good because you see that the sensitivity and the specificity is above 85%, which is really good for this challenging patient. And when you look at the table, you see that there is a quite strong correlation between UHRCT and ICA, and there is only one false negative of UHRCT. When you dive a little bit in the paper, you find what I think are two interesting findings. First of all, there are two patients that also underwent before the UHR CT, the coronary, a conventional coronary CTA. And in one case, the UHR CT was able to correctly identify non-obstructive disease that was labeled as obstructive on conventional CT. These are the images from the paper. You see here the conventional CT, so heavily calcified vessel, questionable significant stenosis here and you see on the UHR CT that even though the vessel is heavily calcified there is much less blooming and uh, you uh, can uh, classify this as non-obstructive which has been confirmed by the ICA and also three cases where uh, UHR CT was able to correctly rule out obstructive TAD so this paper uh, gives us a glimpse about the possible advantages of UHR CT in coronary CTA, mostly in very challenging patients. So the question is, can we bring these advantages to conventional CT? And this leads us to the second point, how is SRDLR working? So SRDLR is basically based on the same principle as DLR, which involves 3D conventional neural networks. So you have the target images, it's high resolution uh, coronary CTA, and the standard images are simulated conventional CT images. And in the factory, you built the neural network that enables to go from standard to high resolution. And on site, you feed the algorithm with standard images, and in return, 
you get high resolution images. This is on site. This is currently only available for Cardiac CT. So in a routine CT rotation, basically it's working as DLR, so namely ACE is working. It's relatively transparent for the end user. The end user, it's done on site. The reconstruction speed is about two minutes per volume. So the impact on the workflow is minimal. So what are the advantages that we can expect from using this technology? So when we dive a little bit in the first uh, patients that we images with this technology, first of all, what we can notice is a significant noise reduction, even if compared with DLR. You can see here, this is the iterative reconstruction, the standard DLR, ACE, SRDLR peak. You see that there is a significant reduction in the background noise. Second, you see an increased sharpness of um, all the vascular and anatomical structures, and the conspicuity of uh, the structures and the contour are better uh, seen. Here, for example, look at the mitral valve, the anterior leaflet. It's perfectly uh, seen, and the borders are really sharp compared to DLR, and in ER, you can barely see it. Even on subtle lesions, such as this very subtle uh, aortic valve calcification, it is better seen with SRDLR. And this will stay when you do curved MPR. In curved MPR also, the sharpness of the uh, uh, vessels is uh, better with SRDLR. You have also a better delineation of the smaller structures, such as small arterial branch, for example, this one here that you can see on SRDLR and you can barely see it in ER and DLR, or this small branch here that is perfectly seen here, but very difficult to see on the other reconstruction. And fourth point, you get an increased conspicuity of calcifications, mostly on faint or subtle low density calcifications, such as for example here, where you can see perfectly the calcification, whereas on the other reconstruction, it's quite a bit challenging. So all these points, the uh, noise reduction, the increased sharpness, the better delineation of small structures, and the increased conspicuity of calcifications will lead to a higher image quality in the end with SRDLR compared to what you get with DLR and, of course, what you get with the uh, usual iterative reconstruction techniques. So in the end, in a routine clinical world, what can you expect? So you can expect to get the advantages of UHRCT. So all these decreased noise, uh, decreased noise higher uh, conspicuity of smaller lesion, increased spatial resolution, but without the drawbacks. So all that at a lower cost with of course a higher number of machine to be able to do that. The uh, availability of a wide area detector, which is something that once you get it, you cannot go back when you do cardiac imaging. The faster rotation time, the ability to use systematically for all patients 100 kV and all that at the lowest radiation dose. So this is really like combining best of both worlds. So let's see some clinical examples. You see this mixed or mostly non-calcified plaque. Look at the DLP compared to a 600 plus in uh, the radiology paper published last year. And this is reconstructed with iterative reconstruction. This is reconstructed with SRDLR. You can see much better the, uh, the contour of the plaque and also a much better differentiation of the residual lumen inside compared to uh, iterative reconstruction. Look at this mixed uh, plaque in the proximal LAT. With SRDLR, it's uh, much more easier to see the contour and also to see the faint calcifications inside the plaque. Look at this heavily calcified patient, calcium score about two, above 2000, DLP still very low, and with SRDLR, you have less blooming and it's easier to see the lumen inside this heavily calcified LAD. Same thing here, another curved NPR view of the same patient. Again, easier to see the lumen inside this very heavily calcified vessel. So we have seen what is possible now with SRGLR. That leaves us with the last question. 
what are the future development that we can uh, expect from this technology. There is currently a major development in the pipeline is the ability to get a 1024 matrix. So currently when we use SRDLR, so when we use PIC, we give the algorithm a, a, a 520, 512 by 512 matrix, and it gives us back an images increased in spatial resolution, in uh, sharpness uh, with lesser nodes, but still in 512 matrix. So theoretically, the increased spatial resolution that you can achieve with the technology is limited because the matrix size is not increased. And this potential limitation could be overruled by increasing the matrix size. And that is what uh, this development is uh, aimed at. So basically, instead of uh, having an output in a matrix size of 512, you have the output in a matrix size of 1024. So let me share some example with you. This is SRDLR with the 512 matrix. This is SRDLR with the 1024 matrix. And you see that the sharpness of uh, the uh, lesions are better seen with a 1024 matrix, even when you zoom in very high in the image. Same thing here with the, the, the patient with the heavily calcified vessel. You can see better the depiction of the calcification with SRDLR. Here again, you see the lumen inside this heavily calcified vessel is better seen compared to the 5-4 matrix or compared to DLR or ER reconstruction. And this last example, I think, is very uh, uh, speaking by itself. Look at this uh, um, mechanical valve, and you see that the sharpness of the contour are way more, more better with a 1024 matrix compared to 512 matrix or compared to DLR or ER reconstruction. So to conclude, to conclude PEAK, aka SRDLR in routine and in 2022 is an AI algorithm dedicated to enhance or to increase the image quality of coronary CTA. So for now, this technology is dedicated to cardiac CT. It will for sure come to chest CT, MSK, and neuro later, but for now it is only available for cardiac CT. And what is important is that you can use it without any impact on the workflow or the dosimetry. You have an increased perceived image quality of coronary CTA, and in the end, it could carry a potential diagnostic impact. As we have seen, probably a better assessment of highly calcified vessel, possibly also a better delineation of minimal atherosclerotic lesion, and also maybe a possible better plaque quantification. So this is very promising, and I think it's only the beginning of the technology, and we hope that uh, we will see more in the future. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mikhail, uh, for those impressing images. Can't wait to have the peak technology here in Berlin up and running. Then we'll move on to the next speaker. I'm very happy to introduce to you Dr. Benoit Sauer. He is a radiologist. He works at the Groupe d'Imagerie Medicale, also in, in Strasbourg in France. And he's a, a very well-known um, radiologist for onco uh, oncology patients. And of course, then he knows the value of MRI um, and has, has deep knowledge uh, gained over the last years. And he'll talk about the ongoing revolution in body MR imaging with artificial intelligence. Um, Benoit, thanks for uh, being part of this webinar and the stage is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Kenan. Thank you, everyone, to be here. I'm talking about the ongoing revolution of uh, artificial intelligence in imaging. I'll speak about CT scan to make the junction and also uh, about MRI. So what is it? Uh, artificial intelligence is working about computer. It's, it's a generic word. Uh, it began. It began. Uh, it started in the 50s. But yet, uh, from uh, 10 years ago, uh, there is deep learning, and uh, as you will see, deep learning is a revolution because it uh, permits uh, lots of things, uh, especially in image quality, as you have seen with uh, Michael. Uh, what are the applications? We have seen uh, diagnosis, uh, perhaps uh, segmentation and so, but image quality is very, very uh, important, as you will see. 
how would this work? Uh, there is a neural network. You give to this neural network uh, noisy images and the proposition of denoise the image. So you train the algorithm and you obtain with noisy images good uh, good quality images. Uh, on Canon, it's uh, the um, the third is ACE. Uh, it decreases the noise level, uh, and uh, with a noisy image, uh, you obtain denoise the image. The new product that you have seen uh, with Michael is a bike. Uh, there is a denoising Im uh, <coughs> pattern, and also it's, uh, there is an upscale of the matrix size, so you gain in uh, spatial uh, resolution. The first development on deep learning reconstruction is uh, CT scans. There is a great, great improvement of image quality and a large decrease of irradiation. Uh, the irradiation is a problem of, on CT scan, as you know, and also there is much and much uh, more um, uh, cities that we realize. Uh, for example, we make more CT of the chest versus radiography since the COVID. For renal stone, it's much better than ultrasound. Uh, in oncology, we have a better survival of patients and uh, closer control. So we make lots of more CT scan. Uh, for example, the diagnostic reference in Europe, I have took uh, French, Germany, Swiss, and, and you can see uh, that the levels are quite the same. Uh, the ECLID is a um, European project uh, for uh, make the same dose in the whole Europe. Also, uh, to have clinical adaptation. For example, in Germany, you have uh, a special protocol for just lung evaluation under 100 of DLP, and in Swiss for renal stone under uh, two, uh, 280. Effect of IA is clear, it's a major decrease of dose. For example, we change a CT scan in uh, one of our clinics, the clinic of Orangey, from a classical Achillean Prime SP with uh, uh, iterative reconstruction to one CT scan with deep learning reconstruction. And so with the deep learning reconstruction, we decrease the dose uh, in, uh, incredibly. Uh, it's like... Uh, <clears throat> Black Friday sales are more than 50%. Uh, it was a huge, huge decrease. Uh, before we had a CT scan, uh, a good CT scan uh, uh, in France, and yet we have uh, uh, among one of the best for dosimetry, for example, in torco abdominal. So, so I uh, see uh, some uh, picture. For example, a patient followed for a pancreatic cancer. Uh, we have made a, a CT scan in May and yet a CT scan in November. As you can see, the image is quite better. Uh, you can see the Vrexum channel, it's much better. The kidneys, the, spl the, the spleen and the liver, it's much better with a much, much lower dose for a TAP 144. Uh, another example, a renal cl uh, colleague for a patient of 30 years, uh, we have the whole exploration of the abdomen for just 100 of DLP. Uh, it's very interesting. It's much better than, than sonography, as you say, but the cost uh, of irradiation is very, very low. A last example of CT scan. Uh, for a, a, a young patient of uh, 20 years, uh, as you can see, uh, it's our normal dose in CT scan. Uh, we always work on low dose for pulmonary and uh, mediastinal uh, evaluation. What uh, for conclusion on CT, the deep learning uh, allows a better exploration for lower duration. So we make more CT scan. Uh, with a, a great increase of number, but it won't lead to an increase of irradiation of population. So there is an individual LRA and population safety due to the uh, DLR. And MRI, there is a great work of all constructors uh, on optimization of acquisition of seconds, case space, different speeders, course channels, but deep learning reconstruction is a major additional layer for improvement of image quality and also gain time and MRI is important for patients. So radiologists have more choice and more capacity to adapt uh, to make better image for each patient characteristic. There is also an increasing indication and uh, uh, a need of quality uh, due to the aging of population, a better survival, and the necessity of cross checks, especially in cancerology. So, some clinical example of, of uh, our clinic. It's real life example for our service from the last months and different application. 
So in abdominal and visceral imaging, the quality is essential, essential to make the diagnosis. For upper abdomen, the length of breathe hold is a limit. Uh, for whole body uh, diffusion, the duration of examination could be problematic. So we will see. An image without error, an image with the error, 15 seconds. As you can see, there is a great increase of image quality. So it's very, very important for the patient. For uh, an example of a woman of 36 years with an hepatic mass in sonography, we make a CT scan. Twice, uh, 14 seconds, we have a T2 of the wool hepatic, uh, wool hepatic uh, exploration. So we see the mass. Uh, in diffusion, it's only 2 minutes 34, 35, 36 slice with a high quality that's due to haze. So for this example, we have a, a hammer liver protocol of less than 10 minutes. So we have made also a low dose CT scan of the wool torque abdominal exploration. It's also a very interesting for a uh, patient uh, altered. For example, this altered patient, uh, for the breath hold was difficult, was difficult. So we make uh, shorter sequences of 13 seconds in dynamics. So we have high quality even in, in an uh, altered patient. Uh, uh, a last example of uh, liver uh, collection after cholecystectomy. You can see here a lushka. Uh, with, uh, on a MIPRO construction is 90 slices of two millimeters in one result of uh, 19 seconds. Uh, for prostate, we can make an examination in 10, quite 10 minutes uh, of the wool exploration for pyrads. So one example with a pyrads 4 with a lesion in T2 uh, uh, in high signal in diffusion and low signal, signal in ADC, very well uh, seen. Other example, an anterior lesion with a low signal in T2, hyper signal in diffusion, and very low signal in ADC, less of 10 minutes. So extension, extension of uh, prostate cancer, you can see the capsule is ruptured. And so uh, we have a, a rapid extension of the this prostate cancer. Uh, a perianal fistula, you can see uh, in one minute 48, a good T2 exploration and see uh, with anatomical uh, precision where is the fistula. And so uh, with uh, an injection quite isotropic, uh, 1.3 millimeters in two minutes 37, you have the whole fistula. For whole body uh, WI diffusion, for example, for myeloma, the comfort is very important. As you can see the patients, there is lots of colds. Uh, she's fitted uh, like uh, <clears throat> uh, Doug Vador with all colds. So it could be difficult for this patient. So with the protocol with ACE, it's less than 20 minutes in diffusion. So it's very interesting and very comfortable for this patient. Uh, also, it works also for uh, other things, for example, uh, musculoskeletal imaging and traumatism with a rupture of LCA, bone marrow edema, and also blood in the articulation. Uh, the total examination is less of uh, six minutes. Gain time is less movement artifacts, so it's very important. Another rapid example of a uh, lesion of the tendon. So we, uh, in our rapid protocol, we can obtain good quality image and a good diagnosis fastly. Last example of osteoarticular uh, musculoskeletal a lesion of the um, uh, Achilles uh, tendon uh, in less of five minutes. In musculoskeletal imaging, perhaps and um, certainly the future is also Pike, uh, also good quality image with ACE, but moreover, Pike increases the matrix size, and so you can see better the meniscus and uh, also the cartilage. Uh, it will also work in lumbar imaging. We have a, a protocol in less of seven minutes with all T2, T1, steer, and axial uh, view. For brain imaging, the deep learning reconstruction uh, allows the 3D isometric exploration in a limited time. For example, a 3D flare in sagittal 1.6 millimeter durate less than three minutes. Uh, you can see also a tough of less of two minutes with MIP reconstruction. For example, also uh, before radiotherapy and especially stereotaxic radiotherapy, we need very slice, uh, very thin slices. Uh, for example, here that's quite three minutes, one uh, one millimeters in the three planes. Also, the future is perhaps also peak. Uh, you have uh, the, a common filter when you had ACE, it's much better, and when you add peak. 
you increase the, uh, the matrix size, so you you, there is a, an increase of the spatial resolution. So, for conclusion, for MRI time is quality and uh, comfort for the patient. Our standard protocols last in total less than 10 minutes, except full body, as you have seen. IA allows uh, for shorter examination time, is more comfortable for the patient, and improves the image quality. So it allows also a personalized evaluation, rapid seconds to avoid movement artifacts, and also for fragile patients. In uh, conclusion, the deep learning construction increases uh, hugely the image quality along different possibilities, a great lower radiation in uh, CT scan, it improves uh, diagnosis confidence. Also, it's a great uh, gain, uh, especially uh, it's gain time in, in quality and MRI for the comfort of the patient. Thank you for your attention. Benoit, thank you so much for sharing your experience and also great images you have presented to us. So um, thank you very much. Okay, so... Um, thank you, both of you, Mikael and Benoit, for those... Astonishing and great talks. We do have some questions, so let me just um, start. Um, I think this is to Mikael. How about the image data with a ten twenty four matrix? Um, would you? you comment on that? Uh, I think that the question maybe is about the size of the images. Uh, because of course, when you uh, double the size of the matrix, you quadruple the size of the image, then you quadruple the size in for like uh, savings in uh, in terms of uh, weight, digital weight of the image. So uh, this is quite difficult because not all packs can handle uh, 1024 uh, matrix uh, with uh, fluency. Uh, so usually, when we have this, we work uh, directly on the uh, on the workstation to be able to have uh, sufficient uh, fluidity when we view the images. So this might be a technical limitation because you might not be able to view a 1024 matrix size for like a uh, coronary CTA with uh, seven plus thousand images. This might be difficult on like a regular workstation or regular fax. So uh, uh, indeed we need a dedicated workstation for that. Thank you for this explanation. Thank you so much. I was wondering um, just at the images you just uh, presented to us, if this technology will be helpful in cases of a suboptimal contrast bolus. We all learned that you have to have at least a 200 Hounsfield unit contrast in the coronaries to have a a good chance of depicting coronary artery stenosis. But with this technology, with less noise and more sharp delineation, will it be helpful if you have uh, missed the bolus or the patient had like a tick phenomenon or something which just uh, decreased the contrast in your coronaries? Will this technology help you there? Yeah, thank you, Stefan. That's a good point. Uh, I would say that in the end, it will not do miracle. You will need contrast for sure. But having less noise and having also sharper borders and less blooming artifacts from the surrounding calcifications will help you. So you need probably less differentiation in terms of contrast, but you still need a little bit. So it will help for sure. It will be better with than without. But uh, in the end, uh, very suboptimal or very poorly uh, enhanced coronary CTA, they will still not be readable. Okay, thank you so much. Another question just popping up is, is there an impact on AI uh, with dose modulation? How does those both interfere? Benoit, maybe. <laughs> Uh, uh, for, uh, the question is those modulation in the, uh, in the axis Z, uh, there is, uh, I think, no effect. But something which is very important uh, when you uh, make lower dose with ACE, also you, um, uh, the kilo voltage is lower. 
So what is interesting is then you have an increase of the natural contrast uh, with a lower uh, kilo voltage. Also, you can also uh, use less uh, contrast media. It's, uh, it's very interesting for that. Uh, in fact, uh, for the quality of image, it's more interesting to work on the lower uh, uh, kilo voltage. Mm. Just if I might comment on, on this question also, um, as soon as you have more sophisticated reconstruction technology, um, you can decide upon uh, improving um, the quality and sharpness and, and the, the images themselves or to lower dose or to have a mixture of both. So as soon as you decide on lowering the dose, of course, your modulation will need less radiation to produce the images with uh, constant um, image quality. But uh, on the modulation itself, there will be no difference. It's just getting better images or needing um, less radiation in terms of CT. That's my experience. OK, um, here is another question for ACE and CT chest studies. Um, how does it uh, cope with with motion artifacts? Um, how how does has any one of you experience on motion artifacts with with um, ACE reconstruction? To my advice, uh, it's the same. It don't. Uh, there is no correction of uh, motion artifacts. Perhaps in the future, it's a, perhaps a future of the AI, but uh, in uh, that step, there is no correction of artifact and especially a motion artifact. <laughs> Miguel, you agree on this? Yeah, it will remove the noise, but only the noise currently, so <laughs> the motion artifacts will, will remain. <laughs> Yeah, I believe it could be a task for Ken to take from this session as well, <laughs> but uh, I think from, from a from a a um, medical legal perspective, changing the images themselves uh, is a very hard task uh, to accomplish to, to um, correct motion artifacts and remaining um, uh, the, the, um, the cleanness and, and not maybe blurring anything. And this leads to another question. Um, could any reconstruction, ACE, PEAK, or, or um, deep learning reconstructions um, change the imaging in a way that you might miss small details? Do you have any uh, experience on this? I would say that the, uh, uh, the concern that we had in the beginning was not to miss small details because in the end with less noise and higher contrast and higher delineation of small structures you will you will see more the question is that we had in the beginning is will you see something that is true that is really there and can these glr technologies ai technology can they create false images out of the raw data that was the initial concern that we had and to be honest uh, we never encountered this. So uh, in the end, I think that the, the way the algorithm is trained is very, very specific, very narrow, and it will do the same every time. The same being like removing the noise or increasing the spatial resolution. And this is a very narrow task. And yeah, I think there is no um, fear of having like added images because in the end, it will not do that. It's not trained to do that. Same with me. When we uh, started with the deep learning reconstruction with ACE, um, we had the um, normal iterative reconstruction and parallel reconstructed to compare both and to be sure not to miss anything. Mm. Um, we took some time to be really sure, but we never came across even one patient where we had a difference, where we might have missed something in the deep learning reconstruction images. So we turned off those, uh, the, the, the uh, iterative reconstruction and, and remained only the deep learning based reconstruction for routine images and everything beyond. So um, I think it's a robust, stable and reliable uh, solution. Um, the question which just popped up here is with this um, deep learning reconstruction, would you say that it 
can be an alternative of a cardiac angiogram. Um, I think there have been many studies published recently, even from, from Berlin, uh, but uh, <laughs> is this the right step uh, to, to challenge or to tackle our cardiologists? Uh, so we are between radiologists, so we can tell the truth. The truth is coronary CT is way better. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, the way technology is evolving is that uh, coronary CT and IC are diverging. It's not for one, both for diagnostic. It's one is for diagnosis and the other one is for therapeutic. And I think in the end, it will be more and more like that. And currently coronary CT is so evolved that uh, for diagnosis, it gives you way more info that what you get from an angio uh, because angio is only the lumen and with coronary CT you get the lumen you get the uh, the wall you get also outside the lumen so you get everything so of course there has been the discharge trial published this year that tells us that coronary CTA is no inferior to ICA for diagnosis but I believe that we will see that for diagnosis, coronary CT gives us more information. But of course, ICA remains very important. But uh, in the end, I think it will be more and more focused for like interventional and not only just for regular standard diagnosis. Thank you for commenting this. Uh, Benoit, a uh, question for you. Um, is the deep learning reconstruction and MRI images available for all sequences or, um, or is it uh, limited to uh, frequent uh, sequences only? No, uh, it's uh, the ACE is available uh, to my knowledge uh, in all the all in all parts of the body. Uh, that's why I wanted to uh, show uh, lots of organ, uh, lumbar, uh, knee, uh, ankle. So uh, that's why uh, that's why I wa I wanted to show that it's available for all and it gained times in uh, all parts of uh, the body. And you use it as the standard sequence where peak and, and ACE is always turned on? Yes, so ACE is turned on uh, yes. because you have a better image. So uh, why, is, why not using it? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 I think it's an important um, thing to, to um, say that if you have this technology, you, you will use it as the new gold standard in your daily routine and don't want to miss it. Okay, there's another question. I think it's an, an interesting discussion uh, triggering. Um, uh, it's about the AI in pulmonary embolism or aortic dissection. Can it be used for training radiologists? And if so, can this or might this even lead to a loss of skills due to AI? So I, I think we all remember that the, the head of Google a few years ago told that we should stop training radiologists now. I'm happy we did not, because as we all know that the um, mentioned problems that AI would uh, exchange the way of radiologists life um, still is, is, is far away if ever met at all. So that we need radiologists and, um, if I may start with answering this question, um, it can be, <clears throat> I don't think we should train radiologists with AI, not at least with PE and aortic scans, because this is just something, um, which should maybe, um, make them faster and and um, they will be able to report uh, on on those findings um, having a virtual second look on the images and um, training them I cannot imagine how, how this would really work um, you could of course have a retrospective um, scan on a few thousand CT scans and then having like 60 or 80 positive findings and showing them to your residents so that have, they have the complete spectrum of findings seen in, in a one single session. But um, that will, I, I guess we all have many cases in our reading list with, which we can use. You don't need AI for that. 
Um, it's the same discussion on, on auto texts or um, automatic reporting. So do people, if they have a task list where they you just hit check boxes, are they still able on their own to report in a structured manner? Um, the discussion is still open to, to my uh, mind. Um, I will not use it for training, um, but how about you, Benoit? What do you think? Um, I think so also, because, uh, for example, we have a, a great experience for a detection of fracture uh, on, on bone, uh, on uh, conventional radiography. The um, software are excellent, but uh, also there is lots of uh, false positives. And so if we train radiologists to, to say uh, for, uh, false positive, the, uh, there is no sense. In fact, uh, the role of the, of the radiologist is to uh, say yes or no, or exclude something. The IA in diagnosis, to my mind, is a help, and only a help. Uh, if uh, the radiologist uh, learn about IA, there, there is no, no sense of radiology. Hmm. Michael, any comments on this? Yeah, that's a very good point because uh, I, I remember there was a study that uh, highlighted the risk of having AI with you all the time is that maybe you are too confidently relying on the AI and then you will miss things that the AI didn't spot. So that's a risk, definitely a risk. And I think this risk is real. And uh, uh, so... Uh, Maybe in the future we'll train with AI, but uh, I think currently the technology is not good enough to uh, rely on it for the training. Um, I showed you one case where the AI uh, failed. Um, I guess there will always be cases, and it's interesting that in cases where AI fails, human might have it as a a on mini case actually immediately seen as a, a false positive finding or a missed case spotted at a glance so um it it's important to don't rely on ai on a hundred uh, percent um from my own experience um having like 60 70 percent of sensitivity training to an ai solution is something easy uh, to to um, to have going up to eighty percent, eighty five percent is hard work. Thousands and thousands of images and and lots of personnel and time and getting beyond eighty five percent called superhuman performance <laughs> in AI detection is a very hard task. So um, I think. No company by now is um, at 99% or something around. So <laughs> you still need to check the images on your own. And this will be training. And you should just use AI as uh, having more confidence, having a second look, or maybe have a prioritization in your reading list. Don't just copy and paste the finding from AI to your final report. That I think is too early. Time will tell, but by now, no. <laughs> um, is deep learning available in cardiac MRI? Benoit, I think that's for you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't make cardiac MRI, but perhaps, uh, possibly, I think it's possible. It's uh, available on cardiac CT, perhaps an MRI, but uh, I can't uh, answer to, the, to this question. Perhaps, Michael, do you know? Um, I think it is available, yes. Mm -hmm. I've seen images, so it is. <laughs> so um, we are happy to to have images uh, of, of cardiac MRI with, with peak and images of the next level deep learning reconstructions in further sessions. Thank you for uh, your um, participation here. Uh, Dr. Benoit Sauer, Professor Michael Ohana, Great speakers, great talks. I'm very happy that I was able to see them, to learn from you. To all the participants, thank you for staying with us all the time. Please answer the uh, Q&A, uh, the, the, the um, survey at the end. And thanks again for Ken for organizing and making everything possible with this webinar. It has been a great pleasure to be here. Thank you all very much and hope to see you in further sessions. So by then, have a great evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.